Good, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Ife Tayo Ojolade. Thank you so much for showing up and being part of our program. If you are here for continuing education credits, what I will ask you to do, because I know that we have several people that are here. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and say hello in the chat. That is one of the ways that we know that you are here and participating. I'm going to say some general things and for people with, that are receiving continuing education credit, and then we will jump into the process. If you are not here for continuing education, I still welcome you. Um, I, I think this will be an interesting conversation that we will have with my, I have coined a new term, y'all missed it. So this is my sister Polly. <laughs> Clarissa Cooper is a graduate of Mercer University here in Atlanta, Georgia. She earned her master's degree in professional counseling, or is it called mental health counseling? Uh, they, I started as professional counseling and they switched it to clinical mental health counseling by the time I graduated. Got it. You know, yeah. <laughs> I knew that there was kind of a change. So she has a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. She is also the owner and the um, the therapist at North Atlanta DBT. That's dialectical behavioral therapy. We will jump into a little bit about that and explain that. And what my sister colleague does is something that I have no interest in. <laughs> and, you know, already know how. <laughs> You're like, let's be clear. Let's be real clear. Real clear. That's why I wanted her to come and talk about this. She <laughs> has a specialty in working with people that have what we would call personality disorders. That's a very Western term. We'll jump in and kind of pull that apart a little bit in a, uh, in a little bit. But she specializes in working with personality disorders and particularly people that have what we would call borderline personality disorder. And so I asked her to come on because we are seeing so much conversation about uh, personality disorders. It's almost like the flavor of the monk, you know, when somebody has some kind of way of moving through the world and we don't like them, then we're like, oh, they got a personality disorder and just dismiss mm -hmm. that. And what I realized, <laughs> y'all's laughing at me for saying that. What I realized is that there is a way that people move through the world and it really is a mental health component and those folks need treatment. And we are really actually seeing that right now. One of the biggest things that we're seeing right now um, is a good example of a personality disorder. When we look at the leadership of this country, we're looking at a clinical condition, but we will leave that right there. and go to my sister colleague, Clarissa Cooper. So Clarissa, why don't you start out just in general, telling everybody just really quickly what a personality disorder is. So when we talk about a personality disorder, and actually first let me say good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, so when we talk about a personality disorder, we are generally talking about the way that a person relates to themselves as individuals and also how they relate to others in the world. So personality disorders are really centered around beliefs and actions geared towards oneself, but also how they engage in their relationships. They're really centered around interpersonal functioning. Um, and so uh, the uh, older way that we talk about personality disorders is we we have them in clusters, right? So there's cluster A, cluster B, and cluster C. Cluster A, they describe those personality disorders as being more um, uh, unique. Uh, <laughs> like, it. it says eccentric um, mm -hmm. because those folks have a very specific way of moving through the world. And oftentimes they have a little bit of like a psychotic edge to them a little bit in how they present and engage in their relationships. So they call right. them. Uh -huh, they're, that? Oh, OK. We're doing all. Of, all right. Thank you. Right. Let's make sure I'm clear. Um, so where there is a, a clear distinction in how they perceive the world or perceive themselves. So there is um, a, a sense of like things being a little less reality based. Um, and so because of being a little less reality based, they tend to be a bit more eccentric in how they engage with others. Then there's cluster B. Cluster B, they call that cluster the dramatic and erratic crew. 
Okay, and these are my people. Um, and so cluster B tends to be um, dramatic and erratic. Um, they have a much larger personality presence when they are in the room. You tend to know that they are in the room. And they also tend to be the personality disorders that folks have the most difficult time engaging with because there are a lot of behavioral um, aspects that show up in relationships that are hard to engage with, um, I think, in a different way than the other two clusters. And then with cluster C, these tend to be the personality disorders that are a little bit more rigid. Um, they tend to be also um, a bit more avoidant in relationships. So cluster B, they're like, I'm all up in the mix, right? Let's get in here. Uh, cluster A tends to be like, huh, it's so interesting that you see the world that way because I see it in this completely different way, right? Um, <laughs> And people are like, oh, that's really interesting. But then cluster C, they tend to be a bit more avoidant. They tend to be a bit more withdrawn and a bit more rigid or very, very, very over controlled is what we would say. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, I know in your specific specialty is borderline personality disorder. So talk just a little bit about borderline personality disorder. Yeah, so when we talk about borderline personality disorder, I think it's easiest to think about it in terms of what we call the categories of dysregulation, okay? So there's five categories of dysregulation. And so um, basically for the five categories, we take the diagnostic criteria of borderline personality disorder and we break it into five categories. So um, the first category we talk about is um, emotional dysregulation. Emotional dysregulation looks like a lot of mood labilities. So mood lability is fancy word to say mood swings, right? So swinging from one extreme to the other. And oftentimes those swings in mood are in response to some sort of interpersonal interaction that was uncomfortable or displeasing or invalidating. And we'll talk about this idea of invalidation um, a little bit later in our conversation today. Um, so it's a lot of mood swings and it's also really, really, really intense emotions. So high highs and low lows, and it can be changing multiple times within a day or every couple of days. Um, there is also cognitive dysregulation, right? And so cognitive dysregulation is centered around a lot of very, very rigid thinking patterns. And so we talk about there being black and white, all or none, either or thinking, which is another form of extremes. So it's got to be all one thing or it's got to be all the other. And folks that have cognitive dysregulation and that rigid thinking, um, they have a different difficulty seeing things in the middle ground, right? Being able to see what we would say is the both and or the gray. Um, cognitive dysregulation also includes some paranoia, right? Um, sometimes it is thinking that folks don't really like them. And so because folks don't like them, they must be out to get them or they must be intentionally trying to like distance them or push them away or embarrass them, right? Sometimes that's what it can look like. So give me an example of like that black and white thinking. What like what would somebody with borderline personality disorder, what would they think? Yeah. So um, the other day I had a conversation with someone and we talked about there being like some conflict in a relationship. And it was centered around, well, this person has observed a boundary with me, or in DBT, we say limits. In DBT is dialectical behavioral therapy. It is an evidence-based treatment for borderline personality disorder. It is what I um, primarily practice as a therapist. Um, and so this person was saying, you know, they're setting a boundary or DBT language is a limit. They're observing their limit with me. And so them observing their limit and not being willing to engage with me the way that I want means that they don't respect me, right? And so they're unable to say like, I can care about you and I can respect you and still need to do something to take care of myself. Taking care of myself does not mean that I also don't care about you, right? And so when there's black and white thinking, it's got to be either or. Either you care about me and you're going to be ever present and do everything I want you to do, when I want you to do it, how I want you to do it and need it, uh -huh. or... If it's not that way, then it means that you must not love me. You must not care about you. You must hate me. If we move into that paranoia piece, um, you might be out to get me or you're trying to ruin my life. Does that kind of help? It does. I, I know one of the things that I hear people talk about all the time is it's kind of the stereotype when people say someone has borderline personality disorder is that people will go through this. I love you. I hate you. Thing. I hate you. Don't leave me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> we, there is a there's a book that is about more personality disorder and it is called I Hate You Don't Leave Me and it talks about what I can move into like this next category of dysregulation which is interpersonal dysregulation it is a push pull dynamic that's consistently showing up in relationships so it's you know I I I really 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 want you close but also being close there's something about that level of connection that's also really uncomfortable and off putting right and part of the reason it's off-putting or uncomfortable is because people who have borderline personality disorder have a significant fear of abandonment, right? And so it's like, I really, really, really want you present with me. And oftentimes it's because I feel so uncomfortable with myself. I am in some way kind of dependent on other people and how they view me. But at the same time, that type of closeness is really unsettling because I'm worried. Oftentimes it shows up as I'm worried if you really knew me, you would not like me because at the core, I feel worthless or I feel inadequate or I feel empty. And so then it's the push away, right? And so it's constantly push, pull, push, pull. And so there can be this dynamic of what we say is idealization and then swinging to devaluation. And so idealization is like, oh my God, I just met this person. They are like the most amazing person. And Matt, yeah, you're like, oh my God, this is my new best friend. Oh my God, she's so smart and she's so this and she does this and then oh, and we're together all the time. And then there's some conflict, right? And that conflict is uncomfortable. Oftentimes it's super uncomfortable because again, people have had a history of invalidation where people have not held space for their reality as well as the other person's experience. And so then there's conflict. And again, the conflict, all or none rigid thinking, it must mean that you don't care about me or that you're gonna harm me or any other sort of negative thought pattern. And then they swing to the other extreme from idealization to devaluation, right? And so you have gone from being on the pedestal with idealization, you are now off the pedestal and you are underneath the pedestal, right? And you have gone <laughs> from, on it. <laughs> right, honey, you have gone from the most amazing person I have ever met in my entire life to now you have hurt me. And now you are a person that I can't trust, or you're a person that clearly doesn't have my best interest at heart. And sometimes it's not even malicious in that way. Sometimes it's just, I don't trust that you still could like me because maybe you saw something in me that was really hard or uncomfortable, right? And now I'm worried about how you might feel about me. And so rather than working through that, it's just much easier to create some distance. And yes, as I see Dr. Bates says here, and then discard happens, yes. exactly, right? And, and so I, there's a constant push pull. No, go ahead, go ahead. I think the other side of that that becomes really interesting is the person that's on the receiving end and where you have to keep your ego in check because mm -hmm. if somebody thinks that you are wonderful and they just want to spend time with you and connect with you, that can feel really good. But one of the things that I know clearly is somebody is just all in initially and they want to just share the world and see you and yeah. you know, put you up on a pedestal. Ooh, no, no. There's only one place to go from there, right? And that's the reality. There's only one place to go. And so that's something that oftentimes shows up in some of the work I do with my clients is what I found is that a lot of clients who have uh, BPD, so borderline personality disorder, but I'm going to call it BPD or borderline it's throughout our conversation most of the time they get to me as a therapist because they have been through a series of other therapists that didn't know how to support them. And part of it is because sometimes a person who has BPD is doing the best that they can. However, the best way that they know how to operate in a relationship can be really hard for themselves as well as the other person. And so the therapist doesn't know how to support that intensity and that dynamic, or as the cluster is called, the dramatic erratic components of the relationship. And so then the therapy doesn't work. And so what happens once folks kind of make it to me is like, you know, we really work hard to build rapport and to start to develop some measure of um, trust. And even if we can't get to trust immediately, which is understandable and OK, because most folks who have BPD have a history of trauma. Right. Mm -hmm. Even if we can't get to trust right away, what I at least want us to get to is like them having a sense that I 
I can contain and I'm okay with the intensity and the dramatic and the erratic that can show up. Like I can tolerate that and withstand that and stay in relationship with you and be honest about how I'm experiencing you right now and make sure that they can see that dialectic of like, this is hard and I'm still here and I care and I'm not gonna abandon you in the way that you're afraid of. Um, and so that becomes really, really, really important. But one of the things that I tell my clients when we first start working together and we have our first few sessions, they're like, oh my God, you know what in the world is going on in my life. And like, that makes sense. And you know, oh my God, you're the best therapist I've ever had. I would be like, now let's be clear, your girl is good.